شكرا Thank you, Mrs. Uh, Mariam Lewin, for your introductory speech. Now, after these two speeches, I will invite Mr. Malik Ghalab, member of the Academy of Hassan II of the Sciences and the Technical Sciences at the City of Toulouse, and Mr. Uh, Mansour, director at the Higher Council, after the introductory notes, I will invite the other participants to intervene and say more for the morning panels. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished attendees. I would all, only like to remind you that this uh, conference uh, goes hand in hand with the works of the UNEC, uh, which includes many European countries and also uh, Canada and other countries such as Morocco after the General Assembly of the Network. Usually there is a conference with regards to one of the important subjects for the members. Most of the members use English and so I will use English right now to introduce Mr. Karim. Friends from UNEC and the guests, thank you very much for coming. I was saying in Arabic uh, to our uh, Moroccan friend that uh, we are, UNEC has this tradition to organize after each General Assembly uh, a seminar on a topic of uh, common interest and uh, there are several topics that, uh, topics that uh, uh, I have a great uh, uh, interest to the members of the network and which are related to issues of education in general and this year uh, the uh, members have agreed to uh, organize the seminar on artificial intelligence and, and education. And as you know, the challenges of this uh, uh, technology um, uh, transcend all the sectors, but education is uh, one of the sectors that needs really to, uh, to adapt uh, and to be prepared to uh, a whole transformation to incorporate artificial intelligence in a, a very clever and, and useful way. Today we have a, a keynote speaker, a, a prominent scholar, Malik Aleb, is a director of research emeritus at CNRS in, in France, and he has been working on artificial intelligence and robotics and teaching at the University of Toulouse. He contributed to topics such as knowledge representation, the reasoning, planning, and learning of skills and models of behaviors. Uh, he co-authored over 200 scientific papers on several books, and he taught and researched artificial intelligence at many universities, in, both in France and abroad, including in the US and in China. He was the director of artificial intelligence research program in France, uh, he chaired the Interdisciplinary Artificial Intelligence Institute of Toulouse and involved in socially responsible research initiative in artificial intelligence and computational sciences. Mr. Karim Rillet, you are very welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very pleased and honored to, to, to start this uh, very rich uh, program with a brief introduction about uh, AI principles, as well as its potential and limits in education. You certainly, uh, all, of, all of you have heard about AI many, many times. And I'm sure that you are using AI tools every day. 
even if you are not all aware that you are using AI tools, you are using AI every day. So let me uh, start briefly with a view of uh, a researcher, a scientist about AI. AI is not about imitating human. I think this is very misleading. AI is about understanding and modeling intelligence with computational means. And to do that in a well-grounded scientific way, it used to uh, automate or mechanize cognitive tasks, all kinds of cognitive tasks, and check whether this is done properly according to some criteria. So this is the purpose of AI as a research field, and of course it has many applications. Its methods, about which I'll go back uh, with more details, are mostly about reasoning and modeling knowledge, and about using all kinds of data and statistical inductions. So the history of AI is very rich with many roots going all the way to uh, the Middle Ages about mechanizing reasoning, about mechanizing calculus, about mechanizing movements. It's not something recent that comes with computer science. I'm not going to, for the sake of time, to uh, develop that, uh, although that's very interesting. Let me just mention uh, two things that, in my view, are important. The success stories of AI, and there are many of those, are, have been mostly focused until 2010 in narrow specialized tasks. They were very costly, time demanding, and brittle. Beside the task, they were unable to do anything else. Then, some 10, 15 years ago, there was a huge success in data interpretation at a cheap cost and in a reliable way. And some five years ago, about data generation. When I say data interpretation or data generation, I mean all kinds of data. Text, images, sound, music, video, any kind of data, including scientific data. This is an important milestone, in my view, to have in mind. Focus specialized task, then huge success at cheap cost in data interpretation and generation. The focused part was, in, in the focused part, the, the AI was not as well known and widespread as today. The second point I would like to underline is that for something like 50 years we were working in AI when science was ahead of techniques. We knew more than we could achieve. This is my experience as an AI researcher for the last 40 years. We knew more than we could achieve. Recently, techniques are ahead of science. We do more than we do understand, which is a problem. Keep in mind that we are able to do more than we fully understand. Let me give you an example. The uh, program that beat Kasparov at chess some uh, in, at the end of the previous century, uh, some 25 years ago, was proposed by Claude Shannon in 1950. It took us almost 50 years to be able to implement it at efficiently. The program that beat uh, Key G at Go was in some uh, five years ago was proposed by uh, Abramson in the 80s. So it took us a while to have the machine powerful enough to implement what we knew and now we have machines that are too powerful and not enough understand. So this is my brief point about, few po about history of AI. So let me mention what are the cognitive functions that AI try to mechanize or automate. These are reasoning, perceiving, acting and interacting, and learning. I'll summarize the main functions about the, just these three, and the methods for doing so are logic, probability, networks, and constraints. So let's start with reasoning. Reasoning is about demonstrating, deciding, planning, diagnosing, designing, explaining, and predicting. You have the usual test that you have for, for which you, you, you guess immediately what are the answers. There is no problem in solving these. You have this small puzzle uh, of logic. John is partnered with Peter. Peter is honest. Peter is partnered with Tom. And Tom is, is dishonest. Is one of them honest person partnered with a dishonest one? Your answer? I'll let you think. So the rest is very easy. More seriously, uh, there is a theorem prover here that has been developed for 30 years that has a lot to, to prove a number of, of deep mathematical theorems such as the Foucault pro problems, the Fate Thompson problems, and group, uh, group theory uh, the theorems. Uh, there, there are some uh, uh, Bayesian networks such as this one that has been developed at the University of Pittsburgh for diagnosing liver uh, uh, 
li 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 all kinds of uh, liver illnesses. And there are other examples about reasoning. Perceiving. Uh, the, this is uh, well-publicized uh, functions that has been automated for data interpretation. The issue is to be able to understand signals from all kinds of sensors, cameras, microphones, and so on, about objects, people, sounds, and scenes. So what are the objects in this image? This is not an easy task for a computer because for a computer, this is just a matrix of, of numbers. What are the various things here in these two images. In order to do that, you have to segment the image into areas that have, are, are in, in a way homogeneous and meaningful, and then to give them labels. That was one of the major milestones that, and, uh, that I, uh, I underlined as a success some 15 years ago. Axing and interaxing. When the scene is stable and you know about it in advance and doesn't, the scene doesn't move or the environment is well known, you can pre-program everything. When the scene is constantly changing, such as interacting with a person, or you don't know much about the environment, you have to do a lot of intelligent reasoning about your actions and planning in order to be able to move, to navigate, to manipulate objects, to communicate and interact with others. So this is a major cognitive function I illustrated for education later. Learning. In order to do your interpretation, your acting, your reasoning, you need models. And you have to learn from examples, from experiences, from the instructions of a tutor to recognize objects, to acquire know-how and skills and how to act, and to acquire knowledge, methods, and models. Here, here uh, this is a, a reinforcement learning of Dexter's manipulation. It's not an easy task. Uh, there was no tutoring here, no pre-programming. It was only learning by trial and error with just one hand to solve this, uh, this not easy task of the Rubik's Cube. So you, you, you can guess that uh, it is going there and it, is, it, it, it achieved that uh, quite efficiently. So these are briefly the four functions that AI has automated about reasoning, perceiving, acting, and learning. All these functions are needed for education. I cannot see a, a really smart uh, educating systems that cannot it's not capable of reasoning, of interacting, of possibly perceiving, and of course of learning. But you, you need all of them, and <clears throat> this is a challenge for AI today to perform these integrations. So what are AI methods for doing so? These methods, I summarize them to four main methods, logic, networks, all kinds of relational networks, hierarchies, ontologies, conceptual graphs, probabilities and statistics, and data analysis, and optimization constraints on an all kind of applied mathematics. And these four classes of methods have, are at the core of them, you have algorithms and you have way to implement these algorithms efficiently in machines, software, hardware, in order to do the algorithmic of all these methods efficiently. Uh, the uh, horizontal line methods are more knowledge intensive, whereas the vertical line are more data intensive. And for education, the horizontal line was primordial until recently. So let me illustrate a few things about logic. So what's your answer for this riddle, uh, this puzzle? What do you think? Who, who, ha who, who has an answer? So John is partnered with Peter. John is honest. But Peter is partnered with Tom, but Tom is not honest. Is one of them a partner of a honest person partnered with a dishonest one? What's your view? Who, who has a, what do you think? Say that, say that again, louder. No? But the conclusion does not follow from no. the premises. It does, it does. Really? Either Peter is honest and because of Tom, the answer is yes, or Peter is not honest and because of John, the answer is yes. You just have to do some branching. And this is easily done, not with just three persons and two relations, but with millions of persons and relations with systems such as uh, answer set programming. This is something very easily done by machines. And uh, we know how to do deduction. We know that Socrates is a, is a man, all men are mortals, then Socrates is mortal. We know how to do that very e efficiently. We know how to do abduction. Uh, we have absurd fever. Uh, uh, an inflammation causes fever. Possibly there is an inflammation. 
We are not sure. This is just an abduction. And we have inductions that generalize and other figures of reasoning. So this is something that has been well mastered in AI. A network of constraints. Here is another puzzle about Peter and John commuting habits by car or bus or by bike and motorcycle. And the story is that this morning, Peter left home between 7 and 7.20. John arrived at some time, and Peter arrived 20, 10 to 10, 20 minutes after John left. Is the st story consistent? When did John leave? Is it possible that he took his, his bike? Does the story remain consistent if we learn that Peter, Peter's car was broken, that Peter and John met along the way? If I ask you to answer this question, or any person, it will take some time. It will take a pencil and, and a piece of paper and a little bit of reasoning, if not some reasoning. And for most persons, there will be errors. This is something that is easily solved by machines in a fraction of a millisecond with just a network like this one. And we do that in a, a, a routine way in many, many AI systems. So these are illustrations of constraint network, neural networks. <coughs> Neur uh, uh, computational neuron is just a weighted sum plus some linear functions. So you get some inputs, x1, x2, x3, and you get the weighted sum of the three variables plus some linear functions. You can think of an artificial uh, neuron as just a regression. Probably you are familiar with, with what the regression is, so an artificial neuron is just a regression. A single neuron doesn't help much. What is interesting is to have a network of many, many neurons. So I have here four variables as input, three variables as output, and a number of intermediate computational uh, uh, regressions inside, and I get as output a, a vector function f with a number of parameters. For example, I put as input here an electrocardiogram. It's not four variables, about 24,000 variables, but for a machine, it doesn't matter. And for the output, I have a vector of all the features that may interest a cardiologist. And I do the training by saying this particular ECG is a fibrillation, this particular ECG is a tachycardia of that kind, of, that, of, that, of this kind, and so on. And I, I change the weights, like in a regression, such as to minimize the prediction error. So this is the uh, basics of neural networks. And these basics have been spread out in many, many ways. For example, in order to do interpretation of images here to recognize facial expressions, you have a number of images and you, uh, you uh, label them initially to make the system learn what are the proper way to recognize a facial expression saying that this person is angry and this person is happy. Large language models. Large language models and chat GPT, you have heard of, of this uh, as the new revolution of AI, but this revolution goes back to 1950 again. And uh, uh, there, there, is, there is this paper published by Claude Shannon. Shannon is uh, the inventor of information theory and entropy. And uh, in this paper, Shannon says, anyone speaking a language possesses an enormous knowledge of the statistics of the language. Statistics is underlined by, by me because this is a key word. Familiarity with the words, etc., allow him to fill in missing or incorrect letters in proofreading or to complete and finish phrases in conversation. So this is the observation of Shannon. And Shannon developed a game that allowed to predict what is the next character, what is the next word. And this was published in 1950, and Shannon was able to do this prediction for a number of of transmission, uh, telegram applications, and so on, he was able to compute the entropy of characters and words. You, the the, the uh, lower the, entrop the, the entropy, the uh, more predictable is a system. If very, for, very low pro uh, uh, for very low entropy, you predict everything. For high entropy, you are un unable to do any predictions. So, can, uh, Shannon demonstrated that for English, the entropy of a letter is just two, two bits. That is, with two questions, you can guess what's the next letter, next letter. The entropy of the world is just 11 bits. With 11 questions, you can guess what's the next, next word. So basically, he demonstrated that natural language is regular. That means that I can do statistical induction. I can generalize from 
what I observe in text. And Shannon was very successful in doing this at the syntax level, not at the semantics. The meaning of the words were not there until recently. And the intuition is that words that appear in similar contexts are semantically close. So for example, if I could have a mapping, a 2D mapping of number of words like the, these ones, and if I could put similar words such as alligator and crocodile close nearby, and here a number of, of mammals and a number of roots that are similar nearby, then with just their coordinate, I can, I can guess which word is similar to what. If I, could, if I have this projection, I would associate the XY coordinate to cranberry and check that cranberry and blueberries are close. I could uh, check uh, to the coordinate of crocodile that is close to alligator. Here, my drawing is on just two dimensions. We do that not on two, not on three, not on 20, but on 10,000 dimensions. So word embedding, <laughs> this is how it's called, is about projecting in a huge space the sense of words. So I take the word, the name of the city, Rabat, and Rabat is associated to a vector. A vector is just a list of, of real numbers. And this vector is a point in R to the power n. n is 10,000, 20,000 dimensions. If I have vectors, I know how to add them. I know how to subtract them, to multiply them, and do all kinds of things with them. For example, if I add the two vectors, Morocco and capital, I get a vector that is Rabat. That's it. If I, if I add two vectors, France and teacher, probably I will get a vector that is Jules Ferry. Or if it has been trained recently, it will be Samuel Paty or some other teacher that has been, that has been uh, well known at that point. It's not a matter of addition only, it can be a matter of analogy. What is the analog of Berlin in, in Germany with respect to Togo? It is Lomé. So I, I got the notion of capital with just an additional subtraction. What is the analog of bore for male, uh, bore with respect to male for female? It is a so, if I, uh, I forgot the, the female of a bore, etc. Best good with respect to bad is worst. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, chemical signs with respect to copper and gold. And that's not it. I can do multiplications. I can do how, I can compute how similar two vectors are. You know that uh, the dot product of, of two vectors that are orthogonal is zero. If they are aligned, the dot product is higher. So if I compute the dot product of two words, talk and gossip, and it is higher than talk and babble, I know that gossip is closer to talk than babble. These are something very simple that we know how to do with computers and do matrix multiplications and so on. So this is the basics of large language models. So you have probably uh, explained these kind of things. You type on your smartphone, I come here too, and it, it says to help, for example. So large language model is exactly that, but at much, much, much wider scale. You train large language models that have hundreds, thousands of billions of neurons in uh, auto supervised training. That is, you take a text, for example, the text of Claude Shannon that I illustrated earlier about, uh, uh, about anyone speaking a language and so on. You, you give to the system the, the few words and you ask it to guess the following word and you twinkle the parameters, the billions of parameters, more than a thousand billion parameters, in order to come close to this word. And then you put processes in the input and you try the, to, to guess the next word implicitly, and so on and so on. So this is the auto-supervised training. The capabilities are very broad in natural language processing tasks. It is able to, to probably you have, you have tried it. Who, who, who has not tried uh, natural language such as ChatGPT. You all of you have not tried it. Okay, so I guess all all the, all the rest has have tried it, and you know how uh, good with uh, errors and so on they are in in natural language uh, tasks. They are much better than systems earlier systems that were used on gr grammar, logics, and so on. They are do good at dialogue, oral interactions. The, the last one, GPTO is very good at oral interactions. Uh, I have examples showing that it can be good at guessing proverbs, humor, uh, characterizing authors. Is this author written by a male or female? Is it written by a person in, in, in his or her native language or in a foreign language? That's not easy. Imagine asking the system, 
uh, a text of Joseph Conrad, and it tells you Joseph Conrad was not a native speaker of English, although he wrote all his life in, in English. This is surprising. Anyway, beside this competences in natural language processing, which were expected in a way because they were programmed for that, we have uh, some unexpected abilities, such as common sense, such as calculus. You do not do calculus by just statistical induction. It's, uh, you have specialized algorithms, but they are not here. You do logic, mathematics, programming, planning. All of this was not expected. That's part of the things that we do not understand fully for the moment. I can explain that at length later, but uh, I do not have uh, time to do that, and I'll give a, a talk focused on, on that this, this evening elsewhere. So here are a few examples. You give the system uh, the, the following in, in green. Uh, G is, the, is F minus one. And you give five points for G, G of zero, four, and so on. What is F of F of F of six? I guess it would require a very good high, high school students to answer that. It's at the level of high school, but it's not trivial. If you ask the layperson, probably the layperson will not understand what, what this is. It, it requires some reasoning. Here is another exa example. You have a population of rabbits that grows by a factor of A every year. And you take B rabbits every year. And at the first year, year you have X rabbits. After three years, you have 27X minus 26. What are the values of A and B, the growth factor and the depletion factor? I have asked uh, educators, uh, at uh, high school educators in maths, they think that this is not at the level of high school students. And the answer, is because it, it's a third degree polynomial and it's a bit complicated in reasoning, only very good high school students will be able to, to solve this small puzzle. It's not that complicated, but it's not that trivial either. And uh, the system is able to solve that. You know that the set of, of prime numbers is not infinite. Maybe you have studied the proof that the set of prime numbers is not finite. The proof is very nice, it's, it is a beautiful proof. And you ask the system, give me the proof that the set of prime numbers is infinite and give that in rhymes, which is nice. Uh, I don't have time to go through the, to the proof, but you, you, you see that it's a short proof, but everything is there and it rhymes. So these this are a few examples of things that were not expected. So to sum up, the methods used by AI are logic, networks, probabilities and statistics and induction and optimization and constraints with algorithms to, to, to uh, integrate all of these. And we have been working in AI mostly in specialized things either in logic or in network reasoning or with probability and statistics, and we have a very hard time putting all these together, very hard. So, uh, I'll, I'll move to my next point about the potential and achievement, and here I'll be talking about AID only. What are the potential? The potential are uh, to allow for practice-based learning with adaptation, with very precise, exact, uh, as exact as possible adaptation to a number of things, such as the learner, precise individual profiling. We know how to do that very quickly. Very quickly meaning uh, 100 clicks. You, you, you navigate the internet over 100 clicks, the system can know you better than your close friends. With 200 clicks, the system can know you better than your spouse. This has been shown and demonstrated, which, which is uh, terrible in many sense. You can adapt to the learning progress of the students, you can adapt to the learning domain, you can adapt to the chosen pedagogy, you can adapt to the group if there are several students, you can adapt to the social environment and its, uh, and its features and characteristics and value. Very few systems do that, but this is feasible. That's part of the potential. You can use a number of powerful computational tools. You know about graphical representation, visualization, simulation, virtual reality that have uh, 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 overwhelm the space in many, many things, in particular in gaming and serious games that can play a very important role in education. You, 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 can, you can work with networking, cognitive problem solving, and learning. All this has come up at widely and cheaply in principles. Imagine what was the cause of uh, a foreign language learning uh, lab some 50 years ago. It was huge. Today, 
it's just in your smartphone. Re regarding these powerful tools, here is a, a system that has been developed by uh, colleagues uh, from CMU about uh, uh, something uh, that uh, a teacher wears that uh, tell the teacher who is involved in what, which student is doing what, which student is having questions or having difficulties, who is doing what kind of exercise. You, you see that by just navigating in your HoloLens and, and having a, a, an information about your, your class. The potential is to access a, a huge repertoires of knowledge and data and to adapt the new forms of knowledge. You know that knowledge has changed for the, the, in, uh, recently because knowledge today is widely spread. It is, it is cheaply searched. You, knowledge used to be scarce and difficult to access. It's not the case anymore. You just have to click and you have access to the knowledge. Knowledge used to be stable, is no longer stable. It is highly dynamic, no longer comforting immutable reference. You know that the teacher will have not a lot of chance to teach what he learned. He will have to learn other things during his career. But the problem is all of this is drowned in nausea, in a corrected fluid of information. You have no clear distinctions between knowledge and belief, which is a problem. Both are needed but you, mean, you need to make a clear, a clear borderline. You need information assessment, qualifications, and filtering because of this flood of corrupted informations. And uh, the, 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 this part of the potential and the problem. Uh, in addition, AI can fill the weaknesses of schools and teachers. In my view, not necessarily adequately because we know about the shortage and lack of times of the teachers and schools. Uh, the, the, you, you, you have seen reports, as I did, about some 25 million teachers are needed in the world. But to, uh, AI by itself is not enough to fill these weaknesses. Many teachers do not have sufficient training. In France, where I, I live and work, the uh, primary school teachers have no training or insufficient training in maths and, and science. We use teaching practices and objectives that are outdated, and we need to revise them but unfortunately, AI may not by itself allow us to do that unless we are very careful. Let me mention, after the potential, some achievements. AI in education is well-established research area. It, it probably machines for teaching come before AI, and uh, this journal has more than 30 years of, of academic publications. Uh, maybe you have seen some, some edition of it, uh, AI in education. Uh, there are numerous developments of learning management systems, intelligent tutoring systems. I'm, I'm sure you know many of them. That most of these systems are knowledge intensive. They fill in my horizontal line of methods that requires a lot of in, in investments. It, it, they require a lot of industrial uh, uh, investments, which is also uh, an issue because uh, because it, it constrains their potential deployment, and their assessment is rather weak, in my view. It is rather partial. There are many, many systems. Are not, there are not that many user studies that are, have been conducted very broadly over many schools and many students. We need more assessments. So a uh, few illustrations. Active e-learning for reading for a, a four, year, four to eight years child. Here the child teaches in a way in order to empower it. Uh, a social robot, an interactive robot. This is the, the small robot here. Uh, to read using a tablet to support story making games. This was one of the earliest systems developed by a colleague, uh, uh, Cynthia Brazil from MIT, uh, that had a domain model, a student model, pedagogy model, and interface model. The interface is very rich with many, many things. Here is another example developed by another good friend and colleague, Jocelyn Trocas, about teaching anatomy. This is not for kids, but uh, for grown up. And the, the, the idea is you do not learn anatomy by just looking at books or graphics and so on. You learn anatomy by moving. Move your limbs, higher your legs and so on, and you see which part of your body has, has been solicited, which muscles are involved and so on. If you, if you act, you learn differently. This is called the living book of anatomy. It's certainly something very important. Uh, the winners of the X Prize competition, maybe you have heard of this competition. Uh, they got uh, five million, uh, 15, sorry, 15 million dollars uh, for developing a cheap uh, systems. These they, they have been implemented on tablets to, to learn the basic uh, uh, reading and uh, arithmetic skills 
in underdeveloped countries. The, these two winners, uh, the, the, the system is, is quite good. Kick it schools and one billion. Uh, more recent uh, examples uh, in museum to teach AI, how machine, uh, how machine learning worked. This is from the Lawrence Hall of Science at Berkeley. Uh, a very nice uh, mu museum where uh, a kid is, is, is taught how facial recognition uh, is done in, in, in AI, or how this is at, uh, at uh, uh, San Diego uh, Museum, how search algorithms works in, in AI and through interactions. There are many, uh, uh, many um, learning uh, LMS, learning model systems and intelligent tutoring systems, many, many of, of those uh, to, to teach students such as, uh, for example, to teach mathematics, to teach languages, to support students taking notes and so on, to support, sorry, to su support uh, uh, teachers such as the first two or, uh, the, or this one or doing grading. And there are a number of uh, LMS. I'm not going to illustrate all of this because of lack of time, but I would like to mention just one thing that has been done with Moodle about planning. Because I have seen in some publications that AI is unable to plan, do strategic planning. This is not true. Here is the example. So you give this system some learning domain, for, for example, le, le, learning arithmetic or algorithmic or whatever, and some learning goals specific to a class or students and so on. And you have to synthesize the plan as a network of tasks that are adapted to the students with the timing, with the progression to achieve the task. And you update the plan in some receding horizon closed loop feedback while the student progresses. And this has been done uh, with uh, uh, the uh, ar architecture of the system that you see here. You, you have the repertoire or repository of what to be learned, the user profiles, the learning goals that are set by the instructors. The instructors say, here are the learning goals for these students or for this class. And you import from all of these uh, an appropriate um, uh, representations that allow you to draw a formal uh, uh, planning domains to use a, a planner, an, an artificial intelligence automated planner, and to generate a plan that goes into the learning design to help the students with. And the idea is your learning object repository is an ontology of component and, and classes of object, hierarchy and dependency constraints, who comes first, importance, difficulty, timing, resources, all this goes with a standard. User profile, you, you, you have the usual thing about the academic history, performance level, and so on. The extracted domain knowledge, you extract educational actions, tasks, and methods. You, 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 you have something like that, that in order to learn uh, these uh, uh, search methods in AI, you have two methods, this one and that one. This, is, this one is uh, for uh, students that are pragmatic, and this one are for students that are motors. You don't have to write this by hand. That's the new thing. It's generated automatically by the system. And then it, it gives you a plan as a network of tasks and timing constraints and progression for the students. And this has been experimented with, not that much, but uh, with a few students and uh, uh, le learning actions such as 40, 50 actions. More experiments are needed. The advantages is to ease formalizing of the repertoire of knowledge with metadata data to, to, to have an immediate design of the learner-centered plans to take into account the metadata defined by the instructors, the instructors is at the core of it, and to uh, allow also uh, standards for, for the metadata. That was a technical, uh, a technical uh, illustration that I wanted to add, and I would like to conclude with the limitations and risks. Limitations. You have the state-of-the-art current limitations that are, in many cases, we have unreliable faulty models and these are not easy to debug. We have narrow and brittle knowledge. This is the case for most AI systems. The, we, we have a problem about the lack of qualifications of the likeliness of an assertion. If the system tells you, here is the answer, and you ask it, how likely is this answer right? You will have a hard time, in, but a few exceptions, of giving a figure telling you how likely or how confident the system is in, in this answer. We have fundamental limitations. We know that there is no absolute rationality. Rationality is not something absolute because it is relative to your axioms, to your values, to your objectives. And these are not part of reasoning. We, have, we tend to forget this. 
Remember, Aristotle said, we do not deliberate about the ends, but about the means to reach these ends. The ends are beyond rationalities, and the ends are very important in any education task. You have to keep that in mind. If you consider that intelligence is the capability of choosing one's goals and to act for, to the best to reach them, then AI can help you only for the second point, not for the first one. Keep in mind that because this is critical in education, AI is intelligence without thoughts. AI doesn't think in the, the way you and me consider thinking is with enough uh, uh, global view of, of the ends. And this is critical for an educator, very critical. And this raises the issue of the alignment problem. How can we have machines that are aligned with our values, with our ends? We don't know how to do that for the moment. And there are risks. Uh, These risks have been already uh, mentioned by the introductory uh, talks about all the issues about data, uh, bias, fairness, privacy, transparency, trustworthiness, ownership of data that raise a lot of risk. I will not develop that because this is an issue well known. Uh, you have risks that are less well known about the pedagogy, dignity, autonomy, agency. What is assessed when you do assessment with the machine? Uh, let me point to this report by the Council of Europe uh, two years ago by Holmes and his quarters about this uh, risk for pedagogical uh, risk. Uh, because AI as a tool requires a lot of investment, it tends to amplify education as a business driven by market rules. Because of investments, you will have to follow market rules. And um, I consider that education is not any business. And this, this is a problem. AI may easily manipulate the learner. Very easily. We are all easily manipulated. We do not uh, consider this to be the case, but demonstrations are, are huge. AI may augment dubious existing practices that are not good. For example, teaching for the exams. You know how bad is that? Because you train students to be good at exams, not good at what they do, at, or what they will be doing later. Exams determine what is taught instead of the real needs of the learner and society. Teaching for the exam is a huge bias in most education systems. And AI is very good at exams. It's very good also at grading exams, which is an appealing core to teachers. So the, the tendency is to allow AI to grade exams and to reinforce exams because grading is cheap. We should not do that. In my view, we should try to avoid doing this. Instead of that, let me just mention that, for example, ChatGPT has been tried in a number of exams. The final exams at the medical schools in the US, in, in, uh, in uh, uh, the Polish systems, and AI has ranked above 80%. This doesn't mean that the, the system is able to be a good doctor. It means something about the, teaching, the exam itself. It tells you something about the exams, not the AI system that passed it. The same thing ha has, has, has took place for the law school. The, uh, the bar school at the US has been, ChatGPT has passed the bar school with very good grades, above 90%. It tells you something about the exam, not the, uh, the system that passed it. Instead of that, you may allow for getting rid of exams. In my view, we should remove all exams from uh, our education systems. We should, uh, we should move for continuous monitoring, feedback, and a better assessment. Let's do without exams. It may tend to supplement the teacher. Why is that the case? Because it's easy to do things without the teacher than with the teacher. If I have to implement an AI system, I know because I, I did that in many cases, not for teaching, but for other things, that with human interactions, things become much, much more complex. Take a, a driverless car. It's much more difficult to develop a driverless, driverless car with a driver than without the driver. I can explain what, but it's really a problem to have the driver with a driverless car. It's better to do without. Just remove any control. And this is true for airplane as well. This is something I worked on. So instead of getting rid of, of the teacher for the reasons I just mentioned, we may try to empower the teacher, to give the teacher more power to, to do his duties. For, with a teaching assistant that help the teacher to assemble, to organize resources, to have better support for the students 
for each student to monitor progress, to moderate groups, groups and forums, and to do without the exams. Uh, again, to rely on this continuous monitoring. But we have also the advice parents. Many parents are lost with the content that is being thought. They are lost with the pedagogy, and they may be also lost what, with their, their own kids, what they learn and what they have not learned, and what are their problems. We need to help parents about the domain, the pedagogy, and the students. Lifelong monitor and virtual PE and digital twin for the students. This is a, a dream, but I think it's feasible uh, to, to work on some of this. AI for educational research. AI is not just a tool. Here, the title of this seminar is AI as a tool, but in my view, AI is not just a tool. It has to go beyond a tool. AI as a way to model how learning works, how learning for us, for human, works. AI to improve how we teach. We have many examples. AI to reassess what we teach. We do not have many examples. In my view, we should reconsider what we teach. What is important in our, in our, for, for our view, values about what we teach? We seldom question what we teach. We only consider how we teach. I'm, I think that we should move to more about the fundamentals than the techniques, because the machines are better at, uh, than us at the techniques. We should work on problem solving at the fundamentals, our reasoning, using knowledge, querying, modeling the, the world at the fundamentals. How knowledge can be trusted? What, what is the justifications? Social awareness. This is something very important. It's not the techniques of manipulating and so on, but what, what is my place in, in society? And using AI machines is also part of uh, reassess what we teach. Uh, the late philosopher who died a uh, few weeks ago, uh, Daniel Dennett said we should have a, a user license to allow someone to use AI. That's strange. <laughs> he was, uh, in a way, provocative. Daniel Dennett was always provocative. But to say that this is too serious to allow everyone to, 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 to use it. I was part of a few scientists that, uh, that asked uh, for, uh, to, to stop the deployment of tools such as JGPT for a while. Not the research, but just the deployment, because we need to understand more. And in my view, reassess what we teach, have to lead us, give the priority to educate responsible citizens more than training for the demands of the market, which is important, but the priority is not there, but the priority is about the responsible citizens. And with that, I thank you very much. Would you like to come here? Thank you very much, uh, Professor Karim Rallab, for this medic, very... Medic. medic. Sorry. Medic. Medic. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, the famous person as well. Huh? A famous person as well. Yeah. Thank you very much for this uh, inspiring uh, keynote uh, talk, uh, summarizing uh, many key points of your own research in, in this uh, very important area of artificial intelligence and education. Uh, I have noted that uh, um, one of the takeaway messages from your talk is that uh, artificial intelligence is about processes, cognitive processes, and uh, the challenges of uh, that they uh, uh, that it presents to, uh, to to us as humans first, and then to education in general. Um, I will not summarize your talk. I will just give the floor to uh, our colleagues from. Uh, UNEC and, and, and the other uh, uh, attendants of this talk. We have 15 minutes for uh, a few questions to uh, Mr. Medical Lab, and uh, then he will um, interact with you. Mr. Amit Ben Said, go ahead, please. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Medical Lab. It's been fascinating listening to you just at the 360 degree and the depth and the the purposefulness. Uh, my question is, considering how we were surprised by uh, generative AI, uh, how far do you think we are from the desirable perspectives that you have outlined? Any other question, please? Could 
question comments go ahead please can you present yourself please can you just put on the mic please for translation yes okay thank you um thank you for your fascinating presentation uh, i have a question about your proposal to uh to continually assess learning instead of uh, giving exams to students um it ha in my opinion it also has disadvantages to continually assess students uh it make it's, it's may it can be very threatening to students to be always evaluated for instance and it also imposes a new rhythm for learning because students tend to prepare for a test as an event and it's kind of episode in the learning process so if assessment becomes really continuous that that's uh that's a that's a very different situation so i'm uh, interested in your reaction to that you can take another another question no question okay so go ahead uh, I'll start with the last questions about uh, assessment. You're certainly right that uh, it can be viewed, the exam can be viewed as an event and so on. But I think we can make other kinds of events that are very important in the teaching life. And the continuous assessment can be very stressful if the, this is something, and you, you are also right, I agree with you, if the, this is something seen as threatening. If it is something seen as giving a useful feedback for me to better improve, then I'm happy with it. If, if I do train in um, any kind of sport and I have a coach telling me, uh, move your hand higher or, or lower and so on, I'm happy with that. Th this is a way of continuously assessing, assessing me because I'm improving my practice of this sport. And we, we need these kind of things of continuous monitoring and feedback. In my view, this feedback should be always very positive and it should help the student. It not, should not be a sanction of you failed. This is not, we, we, all of us are capable of some talents and developing some capacities. This is my, my uh, uh, axioms. And we have to help each one of us do the best with this kind of positive monitoring. The feedback, there is nothing in nature without closed loop feedback. And this closed loop feedback is something very important because it allows to, uh, to drive the system in uh, uh, the, the better way with respect to a balance with its environment and so on. How far are we, uh, Stephen said, from uh, uh, some of these perspectives? For, for some of them, I believe, such as the digital twin, it, it, it can take some time to really have a, a real digital twin that uh, uh, can follow me all my life and, uh, and, uh, and take all the turns that I, I will need to turn and give me feedback and be a peer that uh, can, can from, probably uh, it, it will take uh, more than a decade to, to, to reach that. Others are uh, m more uh, reachable and it is a matter of more investment, incentives, and priorities. And there are, of course, the, the fundamental limitations about which I believe that we are not going to have a sentient machines nearby. That's something uh, that, uh, for, 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 for me, is not in the near future, foreseeable future. Because I haven't seen anything that allow us to consider we'll have a sentient machines. But to have more capabilities packed into an integration of number of, uh, of uh, uh, cap cap of software capabilities, this is something certainly fe feasible. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, we, go ahead. Go ahead, Maria. I have a question um, in uh, respect to governance, uh, to leading these innovations um, on the right tracks. Uh, you mentioned that um, technique is ahead of science uh, at the moment. Uh, so it's also ahead of policy making, uh, po political decision making. So uh, what are your remarks on how to um, uh, make sure we have the right governance on these innovations and who should be involved um, in, the, in the governance regarding to AI? Uh, this, this is a, a tough question. Th thank you. Um, 
uh, it's, it's a very important point because uh, tools and targets and goals are, are good, but the, the organization is very important to reach them. And uh, the, the fact that today techniques is ahead uh, of science has also to take into account the fact that private companies are ahead of the efforts by public sectors, much ahead. For, for example, in Europe, when we invest uh, one euro in research in AI, the uh, big companies in AI invest 100 euros. So we have a hard time really staying ahead and understanding where we stand and being of help uh, for lawmakers and governance, uh, and governance systems. In, in many cases, the uh, interdisciplinary AI institutes uh, in Toulouse that I, I started and I chaired for a while, uh, we, we have uh, uh, colleagues that are from the law school uh, that work on how to consider these aspects uh, of, uh, of uh, go governance and how to implement that. Uh, the, uh, the AI Act in Europe was exemplary in many ways. Uh, several of my colleagues in AI were against it. I was a strong supportive of it. I organized uh, uh, a large international conference in, two, uh, in 2019, uh, demanded by the President Macron, who attended and gave a talk at this conference about AI at the service of humanity precisely for that. But it's, uh, it's a very hard uh, uh, task because, as you said, politicians are way back with respect to awareness of these questions. And uh, the uh, scientific community is not as strong as the industrial one because of uh, investment. We have to be very cautious. And steps such as the AI Act uh, that ranks a number of threats and, and leaves uh, some flexibility in considering what's a threat at this level and what a threat at this level and reassessment in, in a continual way is a good step in that direction. Let's be very cautious and advanced because this is a serious business and we should not leave it to the market. Okay, thank you very much. Again, if nobody else has a, a question, we shall go for 15 minutes coffee break, but I will. Uh, two, two, two more questions. Mr. Slifani and, the, and then uh, Monsieur Alize, Alize. Uh, Thank you, Professor. According to your intervention, humans uh, have a great capacity to control artificial intelligence algorithms. And what a person can produce at the level of linguistic uh, communication is more complex than what uh, a machine can produce. Uh, according to your presentation, uh, if we can employ artificial uh, intelligence well, it will uh, serve the education, educational systems and not conflict with them. Uh, humans remain more complex than machines. They uh, can produce an unlimited number of ideas and language, fast and complex. Humans can create a machine, but a machine cannot create a human being. Thank you. The, 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 the matter is more... Uh, sure, sure, sure. Alizé, monsieur. Last question. Yeah, thank you. I am, I am Jean-François Chenet from France. And uh, thank you very much for your brilliant presentation. But, and I was fascinated because there are many tensions that you raise. For example, the tension between uh, the speedness, the the the, the p speedness of the development of AI, and we know that re research about impact of AI on learning and some on education in general is quite slow and it needs time. So, how do you? have you an idea about uh, this tension and the second point is that we know in education that practices in education are very very slow so how do you do do we uh, do all of them to succeed to combine the, the speed speed of, of the development of AI and the slow uh, the, the slow less slow, the, the, the time that we need to, to make the practice evolving. And 
you, you spoke about uh, examination and so on. You know, there is a, a big trend now in education that is called assessment for learning, not assessment of learning. So that is the same trend, and that is the the performance goals and the the the, uh, the mastery goals. So the the problem is, or the issue is, teaching and learning to know and not to perform. So, but it's very resistant. It's very difficult. So what I, I'd like to hear you about that. Thank you. Yeah, uh, let me start with the last, uh, the, your, the last questions. The, the issue of the dynamics is a very tough one. I, I used to underline it uh, when I, I have a general presentation about AI all the time. Because you, you, you have the, the uh, natural dynamics that is very slow, that takes in the order of thousands of years in order for us to evolve as a, as a natural species. And you have the social dynamics that is in, in, in the order of a century and a few centuries. And you have the technology dynamics. And the technology dynamics is much faster. And it is getting faster and faster every year. Uh, you, you know the, the um, uh, Bedouin effects that say that an intelligent species evolves faster than a non-intelligent one. Intelligence increases the speed of natural evolutions. This is something that has been debated after Darwin, but now it's proven. Intelligence increases the speed of evolution. Intelligence tool increases the sp speed of the evolution of technology, much faster than the evolution of society. Someone said that it requires three generations to learn the technology. The generations that has developed it the generations that understand it and the generations that will be taught the technology. Because it takes one generation for the teacher to be trained and another generation for the teacher to train the following generation. These three generations, we do not have to, to do that because we, you develop chat GPT the next day or the next week, it is available to millions, hundreds of millions of persons and we have to adapt. So that's why regulations is very important because we, we, we are in, in kind of a race and in this race we need to, to have to be aware of what's ahead and this is uh, an issue where we are not aware of what's ahead because the dynamics of society is slow. So let's be cautious. We, we cannot stop. Of course we cannot stop. We are in the, in the middle of the river and we, we have to keep swimming. But we cannot, we cannot just keep swimming without thinking a little bit ahead. Some of our steps are uh, dangerous. Uh, another point uh, with your, uh, your questions um, leads me to this remark by Michel Serre. Michel Serre said that science is what a father teaches uh, his kids, but technology is what the kid teaches the father, which is quite uh, profound, I believe. And, uh, uh, Probably we, 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 we have to uh, introduce in the teacher uh, students relationship some of this with respect to technology. It may, it may be very helpful. But your point is very tough. Uh, I'd love to further discuss with, with you and uh, I do not have a solution because it's really a fundamental issue of dynamics and adaptation and the speed of evolution of uh, technology is much faster than that of society and that of nature. About human being more complex than technology, it's uh, that, that's uh, certainly the, the case because of emotion, because of consciousness and so on, but not necessarily because w w with respect to some precise tasks. And we, this is what AI is about. I don't like to compare AI with, uh, uh, with uh, humans. Really, I, I dislike that because there are two different, completely different cap set of capabilities. In some cases, the, uh, the capabilities for dealing with natural language is higher than uh, for an AI machine than for a person. In many cases, in, in fact, it, you can take many examples. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, Sarah couldn't, couldn't get on the ship because she was crowd crowded. How do you understand the ship? Sarah couldn't get on board of the ship because she was crowded. Unless you are a good native speaker in English, you do not know that she, a ship is referred to as a female. And you have to, sp to, to parse the, the sentence in the right way. 
and there are many, many examples like, like that. And if you ask uh, uh, anyone to give you a proof in verse or uh, a Socratic dialogue, it will have a hard time doing it where they're with the huge knowledge base that this system have, they, they, they can do it very well. Of course, we should not compare to humans that, that are very complex in other things, in particular with respect to what we consider as values, what we consider as motivations. Machines do not have any motivation. The motivation should come from the persons, from the teacher, from the students that need some motivated from society that brings the motivations and these are fundamental choices. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think the best way to close this uh, very interesting and exciting session is to pick up something you said in your talk is that uh, people choose their goals and they act to reach them. Artificial intelligence can help in the second but it cannot help in the first because it's what gives meaning to people's life is to set the goals and this is uh, related to values, to the culture, etc. Thank you very much.